Welcome, welcome to the recording in progress. And uh, welcome to the uh, session. Um, so yeah, as, uh, uh, as just introduced, it's the uh, resource control strategies with resource control demo. Um, and I am Tejun. And let's uh, get to it. So um, let's start with um, what what is resource control, right? I mean, why, why do we even you know bother about it? Um, so we in in Facebook uh, we have like this uh, kind of ad hoc group of people working on resource control. Um, it's uh, you know people from corner uh, corner applications and and multiple production teams um, working together on this subject. And this is our uh, uh, mission statement, not official one, but this is what we work towards. Um, is world conserving full OS resource isolation. This is a bit of word salad. Um, so uh, let's unpack it a little bit. Um, so the per first part, world conserving. World conserving means that, um, so let's say resource control is self-explanatory, right? Resource control means that we want to be able to distribute resources in a controlled manner, right? Whether they're CPU, memory, or IO. We're only talking about local resources here. Um, so to do that, right, that's our goal, right? And, and to do, in, you know, while we are doing that, we want to stay work conserving. And what that means is that, um, that we don't want to lose the total amount of work to, to achieve that. Meaning that if the, you know, if we don't want to keep the machine idle or, you know, less than, less than, you know, otherwise utilized um, to achieve uh, uh, resource control. Um, and, and this kind of is, this is uh, important uh, because, you know, obviously we want to use our machines to, to the fullest, but also because one of the big reasons why we want to be able to control resources, resource distribution in the system is we want to put, you know, do things like stacking and, and other things, uh, putting multiple workloads on the system to improve the utilization of the system so that we can use the machines more efficiently, right? Or, or to the fullest, uh, to the fullest extent. And you know, if we have to pay, you know, if we, we cannot conserve the total amount of work, the capacity that, that the machine can do to do that, you know, that's kind of counterproductive. So we want it to be work conserved. We, we don't want to lose work to achieve resource control. And the second part is full OS. Um, um, there probably is a better way to describe this is uh, describe this, but um, what, what this means is that um, we don't want applications to, to cater to like a, a, a special requirements um, to be resource controlled. Um, we don't want uh, applications to, to have to use direct IO or you know, use memory in a certain way. Um, we don't want any of that. We don't want uh, applications to, to, to do what they have always been doing. And we want the operating system to be layering um, resource control on top or underneath, you know, depending on how you look at it. But you know, in a transparent way, right? So, so users or applications can do you know whatever they've been doing all the same, and the OS is you know fully responsible for um, implementing resource control, you know, without disturbing how they use the system. So that's what we we aim aim to do, and uh, we have been working on it for I don't know like four years now. Um, it, so it has been a while, and um, this is the um. um the first success that we had a couple of years ago now, uh, maybe three now, uh, my uh, sense of time is really warped these days, <clears throat> but it kind of clearly shows um, what it can achieve. Um, so both the, the purple and, and, and green lines are request per second. And this is from a web server uh, running in production in, in Facebook. So uh, we, we call these services web. Um, um, and, and what happens is that, you know, whenever you use anything Facebook, uh, even through the app, uh, you know, all the traffic goes through the web server, these ser servers, and then, you know, then, then these servers talk to the background services uh, to, you know, show you, you know, what you want to see on, on Facebook or Instagram, right? Um, so uh, RPS means that, you know, request per second. Um, the details don't really, you know, doesn't, you know, you, you don't need to worry about it too much, but this is on production workload. Um, and this is like both machines. Uh, these are two machines, purple and, and green, um, and they are loaded fully, right? Um, so this is uh, what we call uh, uh, like a production load testing. So what you are doing is that you are redirecting uh, uh, user production workloads or requests toward like a certain uh, uh, benchmark test set of machines to, to fully saturate them so that we can you know, uh, load test in a realistic way. So this is production workload doing, doing uh, saturated load testing. And so these two machines are you know, serving six, 650 IPS 
uh, and, and that's kind of the maximum these machines can do. And what's happening uh, in the middle here is that we are starting a, a memory leak, right? So um, imagine, right? I mean, so all these machines have like a web server, right? That's, that's the main thing it's doing. And a bunch of management and monitoring services running on the system, right? It can be a chef, uh, which is kind of you know, managing the machines. It can be some cron job. It can be some monitoring services. So there's a bunch of these things which are just there to, to you know, to, to configure and monitor the machine. Um, and, and, and sometimes they malfunction, right? Um, and we have you know, a lot of these things. So let's say, um, so what this is emulating is that what happens if we have a, a bug in one of those services, which are not the actual, you know, the main workload, but uh, one of the, you know, management things, and there's a memory leak there, 10 megabyte per second, not too fast, you know, that, that happens all the time. Uh, maybe not all the time, but you know, once in a while we see them. And, and can we survive that, right? That's what is testing. And if you look at the purple line, right? That's, that's without any kind of resource control. Um, um, and, and so it's just a vanilla configuration. And if you look at that line in about, it holds on for several minutes, right? I mean, three, four minutes is fine because there's some buffer in the system. And then, you know, RPS just drops to the bottom. Um, and then like, it, the machine eventually gets rebooted and comes back up in half an hour, right? Um, that's really not acceptable, right? Um, usually it doesn't take half an hour. Uh, for the test, we disable like certain uh, types of remediations, but it would still be down for you know, 10, 15 minutes. And um, imagine that you know, this happening across multiple machines. Like if you, have a, if you have a bug, which is triggered, I don't know, like 13th of Friday, you know, while the JSON is out. So there are those types of bugs which are kind of latent uh, which gets deployed widely uh, in the fleet and can get triggered uh, around the same time. Those are like really scary bugs. Um, so if you know this would happen um, unchecked, uh, uncontrolled across many machines, and and many machines are doing doing what the purple line is doing, um, you know the full I mean the, the whole service would go down, right? The Facebook would go down, and users wouldn't be able to access them. Um, so that's something we want to avoid, absolutely, right? So, um, Dan, quick question. Sure. Um, do you, in this uh, scenario, what are the sizes of the machines, Tejan? So these are, um, this is from an older machine. So these are uh, 32 gigabyte machines uh, with, with SATA SSD. So, you know, the result is from you know, a couple of years ago. So now our machines are bigger um, and our IO devices are faster, but the trends is about the same. Um, like number of CPUs. Oh, um, or does it even matter in for this? It doesn't really scenario? matter. So um, here, um, you know, it's a single socket. Uh, I don't know. I forgot the number of ports, 32, something like that. But um, here, the contended resource is uh, memory and I/O. Um, so CPU count doesn't really matter that much. Um, oh, we will, uh, I will, uh, you know, get to that later, so we can see with the pressure metrics that which resources are being contended. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank so. You. Yeah, and, and we are doing the same same test with the green line, but we are repeating in three times. But you can see that um, while the green line dips a bit, maybe 10%, you know, but you know, it's fine, right? You can, you can do this multiple times on multiple machines, on many machines. And while the latency might go up a little bit, you know, the, the, the whole site will stay up just fine. So um, this is like the first um, scenario that, that we, uh, we, we could implement. We could show that you know, it actually works. Um, um, yeah, and um, and if you think about like this test, right, this is was basically the uh, the benchmark that we were using to test resource control uh, in the fleet. Um, it's fairly involved to set up uh, from from our end, right? I mean, we have to set up like this production benchmark set, and and and, and it takes like a couple of days, and and because it's a production workload, there's a lot of things going on at the same time. Um, so it's just really painful to set up, and. And you know, besides all that, you know, this is not useful outside. You cannot really do that outside Facebook, right? It's not really a generic um, um, benchmark. Um, so, what 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 we worked on um, is something called the resource control demo, um, and what it aims to do is that capturing basically capturing that setup and and in a in a canned way, right? So, um, it simulates the entire setup uh, in a single application. Um, in a way which, which can demonstrate and simulate and demonstrate everything. And, and at the same time, it aims to kind of show what's going on and you can easily look at what's going on. And it, it comes with a lot of documentation on 
why certain things are uh, working a certain way um, and you know, what, what they can do and how, how, they, how they work. So it just contains a lot of documentation about you know, how resource control uh, works on Linux and, and how it can be used. And um, this presentation, um, this, there's just a lot of content in it. Um, so we cannot cover um, uh, a lot of, you know, uh, in depth, but we will just go through, uh, go over like a couple of different scenarios, uh, important ones, and then show how, how they work. And then, you know, when, if, when you guys have time, if you're interested, you know, you can, later there will be a link, you can, you know, download or you can set up like a AWS instance and then try it yourself and read all the documentations and try all the different scenarios. Um, yeah, to, to learn about it. Um, and so if you think about, you know, what, what, what would be needed to do all this, right? Um, if you wanna um, encapsulate, right? For like production test, like web, wor uh, web workload and, and, and all those things uh, in a single, you know, in a single application, um, you know, it needs multiple components, right? So uh, these are the components. The first thing is called RD hashd. And this is what, what, um, what emulates the web server, right? Um, and so it, it, has, um, it follows like a normal distribution to access files and, and, and uh, hit anonymous memory. Um, and you can adjust how the you know, memory access pattern looks. Um, and then it calculates the um, hashes, you know, reading data from there. It dirties some pages, it generates some logs, right? And, and it regulates its own load uh, by target RPS and also by latency, right? Um, just like web server, right? I mean, if you have web server, you know, you, you have a load coming in, so you wanna match that load. But if your latency is rising too high, right? Then, you know, you're, you're missing your service level agreements and then, you know, your, your load is shared, right? I mean, you, you offload to some other machines. So it, it uh, encapsulates um, that, that main workload behavior or web server behavior. Um, and there's, Things called sysloads. So memory leak that that I mentioned previous is you know one of the sysloads. It just means that you know it's something secondary we are running on the system, which may or may not misbehave, right? So these are like the, the components that we use to to simulate uh, you know failing uh, failure scenarios. Um, they are called side loads. There are things called side loads. These are just uh, secondary workloads which are the same as sysloads, but which are run under something called side loader. We will I will get to that uh, later. What, what side loads are. And there's a component called RD agent. And this is the thing which, uh, uh, you know, runs the whole thing. Right? This configures the whole system, uh, verifies that all the requirements are met. And when you tell it to, you know, run certain scenarios, it will run those scenarios and, and you know, give you uh, reports, um, um, you know, what's going on, you know, who's using how much, you know, who's doing how fast, how slow, all those things. Um, and the resource control demo is the, the TY, the, you know, the, the terminal app, which has a lot of documentation about what's going on and all the scenarios built into it. So you can run, you know, for example, like a, a protection scenario um, to see how, how things actually work and read about, you know, if you want, like if you read about or all about its details and, and how, 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 how they're supposed to work. And there's a, a final piece called resource control bench, um, this, which is being still uh, worked on. And, and it uses the same framework to emulate the entire system. Right? So, so what Resource Control Demo tries to do is, you know, um, rather than like emulating a synthetic, like a portion of it, it tries to, you know, exercise the entire operating system and IOS tag and the whole thing with realistic workloads, right? Um, and Resource Control Bench is on top of that to, to build benchmarks, like a CAN benchmarks um, to measure, uh, resource control behaviors and, and like IO device performance uh, using uh, these, these workloads. So that you can get more um, comprehensive view of how the system would actually behave uh, in, in, you know, in production, rather than you know, having, you know, according to you know, this benchmark, you know, this does, you know, how many IOPS and whatnot, which, you know, doesn't necessarily translate to uh, real world performance. All right, so, so this is like uh, one of the things that uh, uh, RD agent does. And, and this is you know, uh, shown on resource control demo interface. So uh, resource control uh, is primarily uses uh, C group two, which is a kernel feature, uh, you know, which you can build like a tree structure and configure how resources uh, should be deployed uh, or distributed. But there are like a bunch of other requirements um, um, 
and and like for example, right right now you need a file system which can um, which can be fully controlled, which can be fully implement, which can fully implement resource control is ButterFS. Um, it's not not because you know ButterFS is inherently better um, um, for this, but you know it's just that it's something we deploy. So we we fixed all the uh, priority emergence in the file system. Um, with other file file systems, there are scenarios where um, you would um, have higher priority um, applications waiting for lower priority one. Um, so there are all these kind of corner features and, and you know, various pieces which should be configured and used in certain ways to make resource control actually work. Um, so what resource control agent does is that it checks all these requirements and it will tell you, um, you know, if something is missing and tell you also how to fix it. Um, in the longer term, right, I mean, so many of these pieces are already upstream and or in the process of being upstream and also not just corner, but you know, for distributions are also uh, adopting many of these configurations by default as their defaults. Um, so down the line, like the expectation is that, you know, if you file a resource control demo on any system, uh, you know, you, you're gonna be meeting most of the requirements by default. So um, let's see um, how protection scenario, right? The, the, the first uh, slide that I explained, right? There's a web server and there's a memory leak in the, in the lower priority part of the system. And let's see how, how well we can protect that. And let's see how that's emulated uh, or replicated in this control demo. Yes, yeah, that's just what, what I just said. And um, I'm just gonna show screenshots. Um, we, I'm gonna do at the end, I'm gonna actually run the demo and show, show how, to, how it actually works. But you know, just for time purposes, um, I'm gonna just run screenshots for now. So that you know, we can at least have some understanding when we actually uh, do the um, do the live demo. So um, it's it's a little bit overwhelming because there's a lot going on on the screen. Um, so let me. Uh, so this part is just kind of general overview of you know what, how the system is, what the system is doing, right? Um, you know, configuration. You know, all the requirements are met. Nothing is missed. Um, you know, there's no side rule running and all those things. You know, this is workload at hundred percent. And on the right side, this part um, shows um, resource usage or resource uh, metrics for different top level uh, slices. Just meaning that you know, workload means that where this, where the main workload is, the RDHD or the web server um, stand in. Um, side load is where the side load will be. Post critical is where you know things like secure shell are. Um, you know that we, we don't want to lose ever for debugging. And system is where you know all these memory leaks would be happening, and and so on and so forth. So um, it's just you know showing showing you um, you know if you break down the system into like these bigger categories, how much resources uh, they're using and you know, how, what kind of resource pressure they're experiencing. And this portion uh, is showing right now the RPS and latency. So the green line um, is RPS, um, and and is on the using the left um, y axis. So it's you know 1200 is 100% load. So you can see that it started 50 seconds ago. Um, the load went up, right, and, and stabilized at 100% at load, you know, 12, uh, 1200 RPS. So it's just showing you that uh, the HD is you know, servicing at maximum capacity. And the blue line is the latency, uh, right, right axis, and is you know hovering slightly above 100 milliseconds. So the maximum, uh, the maximum. Um, Latency target that latency uh, tolerance that it has is 100 milliseconds, and this you know when the screen was captured. Um, so while ramping up, it, it violated a little bit, but it's going to come down and stabilize around 100 milliseconds. Um, so this uh, end to end, you know, from start of request to the you know, completion of it. Um, and these are just some logs. And on the right side is where all the documentation is, and then you can navigate the right side with the you know, uh, arrow keys, and then you can activate buttons to try the scenario, right? So it has like a scenario and explanations uh, mixed together. Anyway, so here what's happening is that we just open this page and then which kind of start, started the um, main workload, HD, at, at full full load. So about, you know, 50 seconds in, the, the, the main workload is stable now, right? And if you look at here, you know, it's using, it's a, this is on 32 gigabyte machine. So you know, it's using most of the memory and most of the CPU, 
and also using some of the IOs, right? RNWBPS. Um, so the system is stable now. And the next slide. Okay, the next slide, right? I just kind of scroll down to uh, this button and press enter. And what that does is that it starts the memory leak um, that that you know that we've been talking about. Um, this one is more aggressive, I think. This is not 10 megabit, 10, 10, 10 megabit uh, per second. It's uh, way higher than that, but it's a faster memory leak, uh, but the same scenario basically. And um, after that, what happened is that you can see that you know the you know green line fell. Uh, blue line was at 100 and is now at 400 to 500, right? Your site is down, right? It's not, nobody's happy. Um, and then you can see, you know, here, you can see this is the, the memory hog, the, the memory leak, you know, how, how much memory it allocated and, and all that. But in, in, you know, in general, you know, it didn't work, right? And this is, if you can, if you read the button, right? What it says is that disable all resource control features and start memory hog. So this is simulating the condition of the purple graph from the purple line in the first graph, right? So without any resource control, if we start a memory leak, what happens, right? It's showing you that. So and can I um, ask you a question here. Sure. Um, yeah. In the on the previous one, I just want to understand uh, what is the CPU P and MEM P. Oh, here? oh. What do they represent? These are uh, called PSI resource pressure metrics. Okay. Um, and um, what they, uh, so if you go to like a, a C group directory, there's, a, there's files like io.pressure, memory.pressure. So these are reading uh, those files. Right. And the way that it's defined is that um, it tells you how much time you're, you're, or how much CPU time you're missing because you are, you're missing out on a resource, right? So 66% memory pressure means that um, you're, if you had more memory, right, mm -hmm. your workload could be using 66% more CPU time, run 66% faster. So it, it basically saying that, you know, um, you're waiting on memory 66, 60% of the time, only, you know, two thirds of the time, and you can, you are able to run only one third of the time because at, you know, during other times, you know, you're waiting on memory. So that's what uh, resource pressure metrics are telling you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I will get to that uh, in, in later slides too. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so, um, and the resource control demo, if you press G, I, I think there's an interface um, has, it, it, you know, it's, it's a kind of fairly dense interface, but if you look here, this it says G, more graphs. Um, so this is just me pressing G to see more graphs. So this is the same graph, workload, RPS and latency. But here, you know, it shows the resource pressure metrics, right? Um, that, oops, oops, yes, um, that the Shawa just asked. Um, and uh, here is where the problem is. So before, so um, ooh, like uh, 30 second mark. So that's where, um, where the, um, the memory leak started, right? Before that, well, this is uh, kind of obscured by the labels, but you can see that the green line is at the top here. And this is CPU pressure. So what that's telling you is that the green line is for the main workload. So the main workload was saturating CPU and it had like internal competition. So that's where it was limited. I mean, that's where it was saturated, right? And that's, you know, that's what you expect to see. You're pushing the machine to its, its maximum capacity, right? So the CPU is saturated. So you are seeing CPU competition inside your main workload. After 30 seconds, right, this drops. Which is I don't know. Let, well, let's see why, why that happened. Right? I mean, at the same time, memory and I/O grips uh, uh, rise, right? And the green is the workload one, the, the main one that the, the system is supposed to be doing. Um, so what this is telling you is that the main workload um, was was experience, started experiencing significant memory and I/O contention, um, and that's why it it stopped using, stopped being able to use the CPU. And that's why you, your IPS drop, right? That's what it's telling you. And the way that uh, memory and IO pressure rolls together indicates that memory pressure is caused by you know, waiting on IO, right? So if something is pushing your memory, memory too hard, making it cause a lot of page faults, and then you have to wait for IOs, and that's how you, you know, ended up being slow. And the thing kind of, you know, 
it's kind of sad is that if you look at the, the purple dots, they are at the bottom, right? And this is the, 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 the offender, the memory leak. And, um, and it's, it's kind of sad that this is like completely unimportant stuff on the, on the system. This is really important things, but we are, you know, the, what's suffering on the system is the important stuff, right? That's, that's why, why um, that's what lacking resource control um, um, means, right? I mean, you, you, the system doesn't know what to prioritize. Um, and this is another, another part of that, that graph paints, there are multiple graph paints, and it's showing uh, another aspect of what's going on. Um, and um, this is a little bit more intuitive, right? Um, so if you look at it, right, this is swap, swap usage, right? So the uh, main workload and, and the system, the, uh, the memory leak, both are you know, using more and more swap, if you look at the memory utilization, the system that slides, the memory leak is increasing and it's pushing down the workload, the main workload, right? So that's why it's causing a lot of IOs, right? Because a lot of page force, which then lead to IOs. Um, because you know, uh, the system doesn't know which memory to protect. So it's just trying to be fair. Um, so the system that slides you know, takes more and more space, workload slides loses more and more memory. And you know, that's where you end up not, not in a good place. And CPU utilization drops accordingly. IO utilization is kind of weird, right? Um, it has a, a big spike and then doesn't seem to show much. But um, the next pane shows about IO, what's going on with IOs. And um, one thing which is important here is that, that you know, the top level, uh, the, the top, these two graphs are showing usage and the bottom two graphs are showing latency, latency uh, percentiles, uh, you know, median 90, 90th percentile, 99th percentile. Um, so what's going on is that uh, because of the, um, the the memory leak, we are swapping a lot, swapping out a lot, so which is pushing you know this producing these IOs, right? And we are also pushing the memory of the main workload to to the swap and and page cache too, right? So that's pushing these writes and these reads. What's happening is that all these activities are overloading the SSD, so it's, you know, SSD is getting more than they can handle comfortably. Um, so their latencies are spiking. So write is you know, really bad. Uh, but if you look at just the read latency, P90 is like reaching 60 milliseconds. Meaning that one out of 10 reads you send out to the device, it's gonna take 60 milliseconds, right? And um, if you remember, uh, if you, you know, remember the, the maximum latency limit that we had for the request was 100 milliseconds, right? So if you hit two of those, right, you, you, you're already over the limit. Um, and you know, it's kind of easy to easy to hit because if each each request servicing might, might hit you know, multiple IOs, um, so it's kind of easy to hit you know two of these and then miss your latency. So that's how you know whole, the, the whole system suffered. Um, um, you know, IO really um, IO protection didn't work at all, which propagated back to memory pressure, which slowed down the workload, and which you know that's where we how we ended up with basically zero IPS. So uh, Dejan. In mm -hmm. this scenario, when you say memory leak, is that the application um, or the work or memory leak workload will allocate memory and not release it? Or yes. it'll just, okay, so it's grabbing onto the memory and yes. keeping it yes. occupied. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that when a reclaim comes in, it really can't find anything to reclaim. Is that well, correct? Well, I mean, so, so there's, um, it's a fairly uh, simple memory. It's a cold memory leak. So what's happening is that it allocates memory and it just doesn't look at it anymore, right? I mean, it allocates memory, uses it once, and then doesn't go back to it at all. Okay. Right? It not doesn't release it. Doesn't use. Doesn't it, release it. Just... Mm, yeah. It's just leaking memory, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And when the memory reclaim comes in, it can do something about it. And what it, what it can do is putting this into swap, right? That's how you create more oh. memory. But Big, it creates okay. IOs, right? And then if you don't control those IOs, then you start affecting the main workload. Okay. Um, so that's where you know, these IOs, these, uh, these purple IOs are coming from. There's um, the system trying to you know, put, put the memory, free the memory by uh, writing out these pages uh, into, swap, into swap. Oh, I see. The characteristic of your memory leak mm -hmm. workload is that it would allocate and uh, just hang on to it without yeah. actually using yeah. it. Yeah, so yeah. the swap uh, memory reclaim comes, okay, I can push these into mm -hmm. the swap. And then it, as a result, it drives up the IO characteristics. 
Yes. IO research. Yes. And then, yes. okay. It's a yes. multi, multi, it's a kind of a domino effect. Yes. And, and another effect that it has um, is that because you know, it's expanding in size, right? Constantly, right? And the kernel is trying to balance memory allocation. Um, so it, 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 it ends up pushing out the memory of the main workload mm -hmm. um, to disk, right? I mean, to SSDs, right? I mean, it right. just drops the pages, right? And, and that increases the page efforts of the main workload. Right. Right. right? And that's, that's why you see, you know, the, if you look at this green graph, right? Mm -hmm. This read increasing for the main workload. So this is uh, the main workload taking a lot of page efforts because its, it's memory footprint is getting shrunk um, constantly. Right. So it, 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 it's kind of double whammy, right? I mean, you have competition from IO side only too, because you know, there are swap rights, but also because of memory pressure, it creates, it adds to you, you yourself has to do more IOs, right? right. So yeah, so there's a, a, a really steep competition there. Thank you. All right, so now doing that, you know, doing the same thing with the, with the, with the protection, right? I mean, let's see how that works. Um, just, uh, just to just show you um, in the interface, going back uh, here, it says, you know, you know, it's red, obviously it's not good. Um, and it's negative, you know, CPU, mem, IO. It means that none of these controls are uh, turned on, right? Um, and, and, you know, UMD and side loaders are off too. So it's just showing that uh, the interface is showing you that um, research control is off with uh, why this was running. Um, now doing that with um, with C. Um, if you see, look at here, you know, it doesn't have that anymore, right? So everything is green except for Senpai, that's, that's fine. Uh, you get to that. Maybe not in this session, but you can read about it later. But you know, none of, you know, everything is generally green. So that's good. Um, and this is uh, again, about 30 seconds into the, uh, um, into the, after starting the memory hole, memory leak. Um, and um, you can barely see, I mean, so the, the memory leak started here, right? Um, I mean, you, it, in the bottom, you can see that, you know, it, it did quite a bit. Um, and LPS drops a little bit. And, and if you look at the latency, it, you know, it doesn't quite stay the same, right? I mean, it, it increases a little bit, but overall it's fine, right? I mean, it's doing most of the work that it's supposed to do. And if we look at the um, pressure graph, right? It's, it's really different from before now, right? Um, CPU, you know, about the same, a little bit lower because you know, we are doing a little bit less IPS. But if you look at the memory and IO pressures, um, the system pressure is really high, right? The, the purple lines, purple dots are really high, but the green one, um, while it's a little bit raised, it's not, you know, not going up at all, right? So, so now the, the system knows you know, what to protect and what's important and what's not important and directing resource di distribution based on that information, based on the configuration. And, and thus it's not harming the workload to serve the you know, system that, you know, that the memory leak, the less important part of the system. And the same thing uh, here. Um, one thing which is interesting here uh, is that, oh yeah, this one, but that one's more interesting, but uh, this one first. So if you, if you look at the uh, memory lines, right? The, um, for the main workload for the web server it is staying flat, right? So the system is not taking any memory uh, from, from the web server because it's protected. So that's memory control at work. And if you look at the swap utilization, um, the purple line, only the purple line is going up now, meaning that, uh, you know, that uh, the memory leak is, you know, tries to expand in the, in the, in system that's wise, in the less important part of the system, but it's, it cannot expand in terms of memory, right? I mean, that system kind of puts cap on it. Um, and, and then, you know, whenever it tries to expand, it just kind of swaps out whatever, you know, whatever is over. Um, and that's what's going on. And if you look at IO utilization, like before, you know, it, it spiked and everything crashed down, right? Now it is, it's a lot better regulated, right? I mean, there's some rise because, you know, there's more load on the system. And, but also you can see that um, the green lines are staying way higher than purple lines, right? So it's not being, being like, you know, 50% 50, 50, 50 fair. What it's trying to do is that it's prioritizing um, the important workload of the system than the less important one. Um, so this IO controller um, working. And, um, and this is the, uh, the IO graphs, right? The utilization and latencies. So if you look at the latencies, um, you, know, you can see that you know, it's not, you know, P, P90 used to be you know, 60 milliseconds. Now it's maybe four or five milliseconds, right? 
Uh, so this is in, in a lot safer, um, manageable situation. Um, so yeah, it works, right? Um, if you know the system can do this, we can survive like these things. You know, how many times that that we need to? And eventually, right? Um, in the first grab, you know, we did that three times, right? Um, and what eventually happens is that umdi, uh, which is the uh, user space uh, um daemon, and its feature has been integrated into system D. It's called system D um, uh, but here is using like a, a separate uh, standalone uh, daemon. And, and it monitors like resource pressures and swap usage and, and all those things and, and makes unkill, unkill decisions. So it just kills if something is clearly misbehaving to protect the system. And eventually umdi kicks in and, and kills the memory, memory leak and everybody is happy. And um, with that, so um, that's the protection scenario. Um, and we are 38 minutes in. Um, I'm debating whether we want to do live demo. Okay, let's let's do live demo with with this net. Okay. Oh, I don't know why uh why my machine got disconnected. Give me a second. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I already launched um, the thing and opened the same page. Um, so it has been running for a while now. Um, but you can see that um, you can see that uh, the RPS, you know, is at 1200 maximum. Latency is at 80. Um, this is just because the, uh, the parameters got updated in the meantime. So this is a newer version of resource control demo. And um, the, the, the parameters has been tuned. So that is more in line with production workload. So in terms of like memory and IO and, and like resource contention responses, it behaves, it shows kind of like ballpark behavior uh, of uh, uh, you know, our partic uh, particular uh, production workload that we use for benchmark. Um, so that's why the latency target is more strict now. But anyways, you can see that, you know, it's 100%, uh, well, not 100%, 1200, which is you know, about 95% load level. And latency is hovering around 80, 80 milliseconds. And if you look at the uh, graphs, um, yeah, well, this is not that interesting, right? On only CPU is being contended because we are at full load. If you look at utilization, like only the green lines are up there, right? So that's the only thing which is really using the system right now. Um, and I, IO load is about 60%, right? So we, we know the system is close to full saturation. Uh, it's fully saturated, but you know there's some buffer in terms of IO. Like that's how we want to run it, because you know, without any buffer, you know the system you know it's not not happy. Um, and if you look at IO latency, is you know look reasonable, three milliseconds somewhere there. Um, okay, ninety is you know one millisecond. You know, that's really good. Um, so nothing is really wrong. I mean everything. Everybody seems pretty happy. Um, yeah, these are these are other statistics. Okay, and now. Like I'm gonna go down, and there's a bunch of explanations. But I am um, I am gonna activate this button, right? It says disable all resource control features and start memory hall. So you know now we are you know, doing the exact same scenario. If I do that, I'm gonna press enter, and you can see that you know memory all the resource controls turned off, and um, yeah, this is trying you know starting to fall, right? And if you if you look at this here, system memory is you know is constantly increasing. This is going down, and you can see those things here, right? Right. This is a uh, memory going down of the, for the main workload, and memory going up for for the memory leak, right? And CPU went down. I'm gonna go another graph, right? IPS is now zero, right? It's, nobody is happy, um, and the resource pressure. Uh, for IO and, and memory are, are you know high, and um, you can compress the time frame if you want to see a larger time frame. Um, you can zoom in, zoom out. If you look at the time axis, um, you can see larger time frame. Anyway, so you know, it's kind of obvious that you know this is not great. Um, so let's go down um, and and start it. And now what did what you, if you look at the log? Oh, there's a log page too. So if you look at the agent log, you can see that um, 
you know, a bunch of stuff, but you know, it basically will tell you that what it's doing. And um, that was not six load, second CPU hub, man, five load, six load, yeah. Yeah, this guy, right? So this guy was, uh, you know, doing all this memory leak. And then you know, when I stopped it, you know, it got, it got terminated. And um, eventually, um, eventually the um, HD will come up, but, um, you know, it, it will take some time, uh, you know, just because uh, it, it uses uh, like a PID controller. Um, and, and another thing is that if you look at the uh, memory, memory footprint, right? I mean, it basically dropped to zero. Right? So it needs to recover its entire working set. And then there's a PID controller um, which regulates the IPS and is looking at the latency. Oh no, it actually died. <laughs> the workload actually died. Um, let's um, restart it. Yeah, oh, I can look at the loop later um, to see why that happened. But what happened is that the, uh, the, the, H H the main workload actually got killed. It could have been um, umkiller or or the corner umkill. Anyways, you can see that you know this was not a um, happy um, happy ending, right? I mean, so you you had the workload running at full, full tilt. You started the memory leak, and you know the whole thing died, right? It's just not good. It's a couple and, of questions sure. in the in the oh, question yeah. and answer box. If you want to take a look. Yes. memory leaks. Yes. So the first one, the question is, is there any way to dynamically allocate memory to a legit workload, but still protect against memory leaks coming from the workload? Yes. So, um, so um, <clears throat> okay. Um, there are two ways to control memory. Um, one is uh, one are limits. So these are in C group two terms, of course, uh, are memory that high and memory that max. What that does is that uh, you pick a guy in the system that you want to limit in terms of memory usage and you set the limits and they cannot you know, go, go up more than, consume more than their memory amount. The problem with that approach is that, um, that you kind of have to undercommit your system, right? So you cannot use your system fully, right? Because um, if you set those limits, like let's say you know, there are competing users of memory in the system. And if you set the limits so that Everybody's always safe, right? You have to undercommit the memory. Otherwise, you know, because somebody's gonna be unhappy. But if you wanna increase the memory utilization by you know, setting memory uh, limits more relaxed, then you can get into a situation where the system is not fully protected. So that's, I suppose that's what, what the question is asking. So that's why, um, why um, the primary method of control that, that we use and resource control demo uses is called memory that low. Um, what it does is that it, it, it's, it's a preferential treatment. It's like a, a priority for memory. So what it, it says is that if workload uh, is once this memory up to you know, X gigabytes of memory, then it has preferential access to that memory. And above that, it has to compete with others. So that's how the system is configured. Um, so what happens, what the way that memory uh, is configured here is that uh, workload, the main part has, I don't know, 80% or 70% of memory set on its memory that low. So up to that point, um, you know, it basically has like a most, like a fairly strong protection and beyond that point is just competing with others. So if the rest of the system is idle, it can use the entire memory. Um, if the rest of the system wants more memory, it, 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 you know, it competes and it can give out, you know, uh, as the, you know, depending on how much the, the other parts of the system need memory, um, but in a way which it prefers, still prefers allocating to, to that memory, uh, to that main workload. So I hope that answers the, um, that answers the question. So is the, the consumption is not, not like a, a fixed uh, for workloads. And that's also why um, you saw, um, I think this is actually a really good question. So if you look at here, you, you cannot you cannot see. Um, so this is the protected scenario, right? So uh, all the resource controls are on and memory memory leak started. Um, and this you know this line didn't really change. I mean, you cannot really see that here uh, because it, it's the change is kind of subtle. But um, oh, you can see it here. So the line actually was here and it, it went to one 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 character. Um, but 
if you look at the IOT litigation, it, it, it tells you that story. So, so, so the, uh, the main workload, the, the, the web server was doing exactly the same amount of work, right? Um, the IPS stayed the same, but when, when uh, the memory leak started, IO utilization of the workload rose, right? Uh, not by much, I mean, you know, 40% or so, sorry, 40% or so, it rose. And the reason for that is because this memory uh, uh, utilization dropped by a little bit. Um, and that creates more, more IOs because you know, it, it causes more page efforts. And that's what's re being reflected here. So what this tells you is that um, when the system is otherwise idle, right? The main workload can take all of the system. And when there's some need, like really low priority here, but some low priority need in the system, it can give in a little bit, right? So that the system is fully utilized um, all the time. Um, so hopefully, so that's, you know, work conserving uh, memory, memory uh, prioritization working. Hopefully that answered the question. The second question is that you mentioned that this system uses C group two. What are some of the characteristic, uh, characteristic differences between one and two. Okay, so the second question is um, uh, asking the difference between C group one and two. Um, C group one, uh, C group one, one the, the main challenges of, uh, the main challenge of C group one is that um, it's really difficult to build uh, relationship across different resources. Um, so you can create like completely separate uh, resource hierarchy for CPU, memory, and IO. Um, and that doesn't quite work well because as you just saw, right? I mean, memory and IO, CPU too, they interact in a really intricate way. Um, so you cannot really just control memory and be okay with it. And if you control just IO, you know, something is gonna, you know, you cannot uh, achieve uh, uh, like comprehensive protection for your workload unless you, you, you control all of the resources together and, and you know, control their interactions. So the, the main reason for C group two, the, re the reason why you know, C group two uh, happened, right? I mean, instead of improving C group one incrementally is kind of kind of to have that common hierarchy. Um, so what, what happens is that now you can, you can, you can have a, a common resource domains across different um, resource types. So now we can control memory and IO together, memory and CPU and IO together. Um, so that's what C group two allowed to do. So achieving like uh, this kind of uh, protection, right? Um, like this kind of like, yeah, this kind of protection, like where IPS stays at the top with C group one, um, maybe possible, but it's really difficult. So that's, you know, you gotta use C group two to, to do that, to do this, to achieve this. Um, okay, so now we waited long enough, right? So the main workload is where we wanna be at, wanna see it at, um, it's you know, fully loaded, there's a latency, 80 milliseconds, right? And now just let's start the memory hook without disabling um, resource control. And um, yeah, I just pressed enter and you can see that system memory is increasing, right? And you, you see a small blob, and stabilization, right? Um, so this is a little bit harsher than what's captured uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the slide, just because our latency target is lower now. Um, so this is, uh, uh, the condition is a little bit harsher, but you can still see that, you know, we lose maybe maybe five, maybe 4%, um, but I mean, like uh, very little of uh, maximum capacity. And our latency goes, while our latency goes up a little bit, you know, not by much. Okay, that's not good, but anyways, um, yeah, you should be able to hold, but yeah, um, the, the tuning was fairly recent. Um, so our um, IO cost, uh, the IO control parameters may be a little bit uh, too relaxed, but um, in general, right, um, there's still holding up fairly a lot better than without IO control. Um, and you can see, you know, all those patterns, right? Um, yeah, so if you look at swap usage, right, the memory usage dropped a little bit. Um, so obviously it's climbing for, for the memory leak, uh, CPU utilization, um, stabilizing, and um, yeah, IO utilization attenuated towards the main workload. Um, yeah, and latency, latency is a little bit higher than I would wanna see at, but you know, five milliseconds is not too bad. 
yeah. And this is a little bit dirtier. The graph is a little bit nastier than that I, than idea. But you, you can still see that you know this is you know a, a wholly protected, uh, a, you know, mostly working environment. Okay. There's another question. Um, okay, if you have two processes, Stephen Moore memory. Okay, um, the question is too complicated for me to pass right now. So I, I'm gonna get to that later. Okay, let's get to uh, side loading. This is kind of fun. Um, so um, we have like something called the DR buffer. Um, and let's see. The DR buffer um, stands for disaster readiness buffer. Um, and um, so we have multiple data centers across the world, but let's concentrate on, on US because I'm in US right now. Um, let's say, you know, one of the data center, like there's a wildfire in California um, and, you know, the power went out and the data center lost power. And suddenly let's say that, that we were expecting the emergency generator to, to you know, come back online, uh, you know, uh, to, to back up the power and, and keep the data center running. But let's say, you know, somehow that failed. So when we lost power, we, we lost the entire data center. Um, because we have multiple data centers, like ideally what, what we want to do is that, um, that uh, for other regions, other data centers to take over that traffic um, immediately and transparently, not, not completely transparently, but fairly transparently so that our users don't really notice that, right? I mean, that'd be ideal. Um, having that, that redundancy actually work for you and in a transparent way. And to make that work, to, to achieve that, um, what, what needs to happen is that you gotta have some standby capacity um, like warmed up all the time, right? You cannot have, you know, you, you cannot have like, you know, you have, I have machines set aside for emergencies. When they, those guys lose power, I'm gonna turn them on and try to, you know, install applications and start them. That's gonna take, I don't know, an hour, 40 minutes, whatever have you, right? Um, so you cannot really do that. So ideally what you wanna have is that you wanna have applications, all the applications, warmed up fully and have some capacity on top so that when a disaster strikes, you can take over the traffic right away. Um, so that's what we call, that's what you call um, uh, disaster readiness buffer. And what that means for our workloads is that, is the important ones is that we tend to have some percentage, you know, that's whether that's 30% or 40% or 20% um, of machine capacity that we are not using all the time. Um, and so there's, so there's opportunity, right? I mean, can we use that, you know, DR buffer, right? Disaster just a readiness buffer for something else, something productive. Um, so that's where side loading um, experiment started. And if you think about it, I mean, it's not just DR buffer, right? I mean, like if you have a like large enough fleet, um, there's, you know, you're bound to have like some scheduling inefficiencies or allocation inefficiencies. So you, you end up with like extra capacities in a lot of places. And the question is whether we can do that, we can utilize that for something useful without impacting what the machines are originally for. So uh, naively, naively thinking, right? Um, you, can, you can sort of see that, you know, this is a, a little bit generalized case of the previous protection scenario, right? Protection scenario was, was you have main workload, you have memory leak, can you protect the main workload from the memory leak, right? Maybe we can just replace, right? I mean, substitute the memory leak with something productive, right? Maybe that's that's all we need to do, right? Uh, I'm gonna get to the questions a little bit. Um, oh, okay. No, uh, I'm gonna do them now. So um, the question is, um, are C group two and Umdi Numa aware? They aren't. I mean, not really. They don't have um um. They don't really have um um. Yeah, uh, explicit no awareness. C group two does have uh, in the in C group one uh, the CPU set controller um, does the uh, NUMA configuration things, but by and large, uh, C group two um, you know it's just uh, looking at overall memory utilization rather than um, it's not not specifically NUMA aware. Neither is um, The second question is why Rust? Oh. 
Well, so, okay, why Rust? Uh, yes, I didn't want to do it in C. Uh, I didn't want to do it in C++. And um, I couldn't do it in Python because that uh, if you look at you know, things like RDHD, um, so all of these uh, uh, simulations and uh, all these things are fairly performance uh, sensitive. You, you, you're trying to saturate the entire system with your multi-threaded application. Um, that's actually really difficult to achieve in Python, unless you do like multiple, maybe you can, but I mean, I, I just couldn't figure out. Um, and I wanted to run, run Rust and Rust actually worked out really well uh, for building this type of system applications. So hopefully that answered it. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, okay, side loading. Side loading. Okay, so this is the side loading scenario. So if you look at look at the top here, you know this is where 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 the uh, current page, the, the name of the current page, is the side that intro. So it's introduction to side loading. And this is uh, uh, doing the um, um, naive naive approach where we just set up the user protection setups for CPU memory and I/O and start uh, Linux kernel build uh, in system slice, right? I mean, so instead of memory memory leak. We are now just running, you know, in trying to build a kernel, right? Um, and if that works, right? I mean, we actually have a lot of build jobs internally too, so maybe we can distribute them across these machines and, and extract work that way. But um, that started uh, quite a bit ago. But you know, the, the compilation uh, uh, portion started about twenty seconds ago. If you look at the RPS line, this is mostly okay, right? I mean, so the machine is not fully loaded. Right? I mean, machine is now about sixty percent loaded, which is can be user for some services, uh, you know, when there is no disaster. Um, so the, the load is, you know, load level is kind of okay. But if you look at the latency, latency is higher, right? So it's not at 80 milliseconds, which is our limit, but it's substantially higher than 40 milliseconds than we were where we were before, right? We, we, are, we were 40%, uh, 40 milliseconds. We are now at about 60, right? So there's more than 50% increase in terms of end-to-end uh, -end latency for our requests. And this is a problematic, <clears throat> so excuse me. So one benefit of having um, this kind of like uh, under commitment, under committing machines like with DR buffers is that our latency tends to improve a lot, right? Um, when you're, you know, saturating your machine, you know, you're a lot slower doing things. But when you have you know that kind of headroom, um, you know your request takes a lot less time, and and obviously you know you know users would would like that right. I mean they don't have to wait for things for that long. Um, so latency rising by fifty percent to to extract some extra work from the system, maybe that's justifiable. But you know it's not a clear case, right? I mean you, you know that's just kind of you you you're paying a little bit too much to gain a little bit of you know, extra extra work out of the system. And you know the, the trade-off might not be great, depending on your application. So why um, why is that? Um, why is that? Oh, give me a second. I uh, post my notes. Okay, there you go. Um, why is that? <clears throat> if you look at the um, these are this is the you know resource pressure graphs from the same time frame. Um, if you look at the um, so the latency is rising here, the same graph. If you look at memory and I/O, right, the main workload is not experiencing anything, so that that shouldn't be the cause. But here, if you look at the CPU pressure, CPU pressure is is rising, right? Um, as the um, the system CPU, the, the Linux build job is experiencing CPU pressure, but also the main workload, our web web workload, is exp experiencing pressure. And you know that's was was you know causing not not drop in RPS. But increase in in our latency. And why why would that be the case? Why would that be the case? Um, there are multiple reasons. Um, one is that uh, you know the CPUs are timeshare, right? So you have like you you have timeline, and you're just cutting the time for different workloads. Um, and as you as you saturate the machine more and more, right? When something is ready to run there's a more likelihood that you know, something else is already on the CPU, right? Even if your priority is higher than that guy, um, you know, depending on how, how the you know, scheduling decisions are made, you might have to, little, have to wait a little bit and all that. So there's a latency 
which is added uh, in terms of scheduling, right? As you saturate your CPU uh, more and more, you end up waiting for your CPU, your turn on the CPU more. So that's you know, one source of latency. Another thing is um, uh, CPU sub-resource contention. So if you think about CPU, it's a you know it's a it's a fairly complex thing, right? When you when you um when you say CPU utilization, it's not a simple thing. It's a it's a you know you have you know the, the CPU logics, you have this cache, you have registers, you have you know your 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 you know level one, level two, level three caches, and then you have memory bandwidth, and then you have you know your memory subsystem, and then this whole thing like different parts of it can get saturated, right? So when your CPU is fairly uh, underutilized. Whenever you try to use some of these resources, they're available. As you, as you saturate the, the CPU more and more, it's more likely that, that you're gonna experience some kind of contention you know, somewhere in the whole stack. Um, meaning that as you saturate your CPU more and more, your CPU will become slower in the sense that uh, given the same instruction will take longer time to execute. And, Another you know, really easy source of this is uh, frequency scale scaling, especially with uh, uh, modern CPUs, right? When you are using, underutilizing your machine, um, the, the CPU you know, has enough heat and power budget. So it will ramp up its frequency. The CPU is faster. Its instruction is running fast. As you load it more and more, and it's running out those budgets. So it kind of you know, scales down the, the frequency. So each instruction is not, so the CPU is slower. Now. So if you make your CPU slower, then whatever you're doing on the CPU takes longer time, so your, your latency increases. So, so these two or three factors are the, the, the main factors which play into increased latency when you really saturate your CPU. Um, so what side loader, uh, which is managing, which manages side loads, uh, does is that it regulates CPU max dynamically to ensure that the, the system as a whole um, has uh, some level of headroom. So when you add up these system level, if you, when you look at the system level CPU utilization, it, it, it regulates uh, the side loads so that the utilization doesn't rise above say 80% or 90%, what have you, right? I mean, you can configure um, the level. So, but what, what it ensures is that the whole system as a whole has uh, some CPU time unused so that there's a less contention in scheduling, less, less contention in our CPU sub-resources. And if there's a power scaling, right? I mean, it doesn't you know, push it to the, to the limit. And, and that's what, what sideloader does. And, and depending on how much, you, how big you set your headroom to be, um, you know, you, you're trading off bandwidth against latency, right? I mean, if you have your headroom big, you can gain less bandwidth, but your latency impact is really low. You can, and, you know, you can go the other way too. Jason, mm -hmm. um, one question here sure. with the uh, CPUs. So would you, in this scenario, would you assign, uh, divide the CPUs into groups and assign certain CPUs to the, your workload and reserve the others for side loading? That's one option. That's not what we did. Mm -hmm. um, that's one option, but here we are just using, um, so, Okay, so the rationale for uh, doing what we did, the reason why we did it the way that we did it, we did it rather than uh, splitting our CPUs, is that we wanted it to be as transparent as possible to the main workload, right? So from main, main workload's point of view, it didn't need to change anything, right? It's using the machine the same, and when it wants to ramp up, it should be able to ramp up, ramp up the same. So that, that's the reason why we, we tried to, we didn't you know, segment CPUs, then because it becomes more visible to the applications. So here we are just kind of throttling the entire system. Um, and let's see how that works. Okay. Um, yeah. This, um, this about the same point in time. Um, so this is now running the same Linux build job. You can you know, build, build this here. Um, build job uh, under side loader. So it's now kind of regulating uh, the whole thing, um, the CPU utilization um, using side loading, side loader. And uh, you can see that um, um, it's, it has risen a little bit, right? I mean, several milliseconds and RPS is about the same, but uh, the latency 
has risen a little bit, but not by 50%. This is by you know, three, four percent, a single digit percent. Um, so that's a lot more palatable, right? Um, that's, that's a trade-off you can make. I mean, if you wanna, like, if you ask, if you go to a, like a production team and ask that, if you give us 5% latency overhead, we can give you 20% more capacity, right? A lot of teams would say yes. If you say that, you know, I can give you 25% capacity, more capacity for 50% increase in latency, most teams we're gonna say no, right? Um, so that's, that's what, what, what this gives you. And if you look at um, pressure graphs, right? Um, it's a, like, let's, the CPU graph, if you remember the, the previous one, both the workload and the side load one were, was rising together, right? So the workload one was high too. But here, right, while it rose some, but it didn't rose much, right? And the, 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 the side load one is a lot higher. So this is kind of, you know, attenuated properly now. And if you look at utilization, um, CPU is probably the most interesting. Yeah, but we can, we can go to uh, other stuff too. But um, yeah, this is cool. Um, so if you look at this um, side load, right? Um, added up, uh, what would that be? 70, 80% utilization, right? So we are getting 20 something percent of CPU um, extra. So before, oh yeah, this is cool too. So it says 40%, right? But our load was 60%. Um, this is because um, when the machine can do like 100 of work, right? And if you let the machine do 60 of the work at the same, in the same time frame, the CPU utilization is not gonna be at 60, it's gonna be at you know, 40 or 50. The reason for that is, you know, the, the utilization to total work graph is not, not linear, right? It's, it's a, as you go higher in utilization, your total work is, you know, there's a diminishing point of return and because it draws a curve, so when you load the 60% workload, total work on a machine, CPU utilization, utilization you're gonna see is about, about, I don't know, 40, 45, something there, depending on the CPU. And um, when, you're, when your CPU utilization is about 80, 90%, in, in terms of total amount of work the CPU can do, you're already at, I don't know, above, above 90% uh, in, in actual utilization, right? Um, as you push higher than you know, 85, 90, 95%, you're not gonna extract matching amount of extra work out of the CPU. You're just gonna, you know, be slower um, more. Um, so that's that's why you know it does that forty percent with sixty percent load. And but but you know you, we can utilize you utilize about twenty five percent of the CPU time for you know building the kernel. So that's kind of nice. And this is actually fairly uh, uh, substantial amount of CPU time. So you can do you know especially across many machines, you know, you can do a lot of work with this kind of CPU time. And one thing which is really interesting is that um, this, this rose by a little bit, the green line rose a little bit, although the CPU is doing the same amount of work. Um, so this is showing that, you know, CPU became slower, right? So the green line, the workload is doing the same amount of work, but because we are loading the CPU more, um, the CPU became slower. So in terms of work clock time, we are taking more time on the CPU. So that's, that's what that shows you. And um, that's, um, that's about it for the, um, for the um, side loading scenario. So what this gives you is that um, it, you, know, you, can, you can gain, if you have something like a DR buffer on the community machines, uh, you can gain um, extra utilization, extra work out of these machines without sacrificing much of energy. Um, a little bit of latest, you know, three, four percent. So that's what it gives you. Um, we don't have it deployed. We we did um we did a bunch of uh, uh, production uh, some production um, experiments with it, but um, it it because of the latency, a uh, certain percentage of latency impact affects how load balancer um, behaves, responds to it. So we don't have it deployed in, in the in, in production yet. So we are so that's something we are working on. And um, I'm just gonna go to this on the bench. Okay, so this is, um, if you have any questions about side loading, uh, please uh, go ahead. And I'm gonna answer that if, if they come up. Um, so let's go to resource control bench. So resource control demo, the goal is um, verification and, and demonstration, right? It's, it's in the name, right? So it's, it's trying to explain uh, how this whole thing works is trying to kind of you know let people know and this is how this is supposed to be used why is structured this way 
and all the internal details, right? So it's because there's, I don't know, we, we had to learn a lot of things in the process. It's just trying to share the information with, with live scenarios so that people can have um, uh, more kind of tactile, I don't know, understanding or, or sense of what's going on. Um, at the same time, because it's uh, exercising the system in a you know, fairly, like, fairly realistic way, it's a really good vehicle for verifying um, that you know, the system is working as intended, right? So we actually called, I actually called, you know, quite a few bugs uh, on the corner side and, and you know, at our configuration side while uh, trying to make user control demo work reliably. And then what that leads to is that um, once we have that framework, right, you can build a benchmark on top of, right? Using all these components, you can simulate the entire system uh, to, to, to some, some kind of canned, you know, a, a benchmark to measure certain behaviors and test certain behaviors. And um, this is uh, became uh, fairly important for us, especially for, for um, uh, SSDs, because if you think about how SSDs are benchmarked, um, then you do, you know, file or you do, you know, IOPS or, or measure these different things. And you sometimes do like capture IO trace and run them and try to measure time and all that. But that doesn't, um, that doesn't really tell us um, how, how they would behave under um, under under like resource contention, so especially memory contention, because um, as I as we we uh, so earlier, memory contention tends to create a lot more IOs, right? I mean, both in terms of writeouts and pay, increased page faults. So on, on under those conditions, right? Um, uh, read latency becomes really important with like this this certain IO pattern that the kernel generates for swap outs. Um, so they can interact really badly, and and you know. And then we cannot really protect the workload properly. Properly, um, so so we wanted something which can which can um, which which would reproduce the actual 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 jobs, right? The actual scenarios that we are interested in to benchmark um, devices. Um, so that's a uh, research on the bench. So that's a reason, right? Uh, system behavior under resource contention tends to be really complex. Um, and it's kind of difficult to capture in simple benchmarks. Um, so what Resource Control Bench does is that it, it you know, uh, simulates the entire system application and kernel and everything, and not like, it, it simulates the scenario so that we can exercise all the code path in the corner and then everywhere um, to make sure in the, in the devices that you know, it actually works and, and we can measure how they work. Um, and one interesting, um, application for um, this type of benchmark is um, for IO cost. So IO cost is the, um, the IO controller uh, with the thing which distributes the IO resources um, you know, across different parts of the system that, that you know, the whole thing use. And um, it, is, uh, it has, um, what it does is that it has like an internal model of uh, what the device can do. Um, so it has like model parameters and it has like a QoS target parameters, right? I mean, quality of service parameters. So it has, in, in total, it has like a little bit over a dozen parameters to configure um, to make it work well. Um, and um, obviously, you know, if you have to configure like a dozen parameters, you know, for IO control, it's, it's not trivial. And um, even default configuration works more or less, but you know, this configuration just turns out to be like really difficult. Um, so tuning the QS parameters, like uh, what kind of, of uh, overall throttling that we need to do to, to obtain, uh, to meet the latency requirements, uh, turned out to be really challenging. Um, but uh, what we did uh, with IOCOS tune benchmark, which is part of a resource control, one of the scenarios in resource, resource control bench, um, is that we simulate the whole thing, right? So what we are interested in is whether this device can protect, how well it, the device can protect at different performance level, at different throttling level. So it probes, so it, it, it repeats the scenario that we, we ran in the live demo over and over and over again at different performance level, throttling level on the device and, and gathers a lot of data and then analyze the data to, to eventually you know, provide solutions, right? So if you throttle the, this device to this level, you can obtain that level of protection. So that's what it does. So here is an, an example output from uh, one of the, uh, SSDs that, that we, we use in in um, uh, in the flip. 
and um, in production. And you know, it's, it's just a lot, but um, on the left side, well, the, the most important, this one is called the memory of loading factor. So X axis on all these graphs is that how much we are throttling uh, overall. So 100% is the, well, so it's, you know, we are not throttling at all. Like, so we are letting the device do whatever the device can do. And we are just gradually kind of, you know, slowing down overall IOs, uh, how many IOs we are issuing per time and then seeing, you know, observing the behavior. Um, so right side, let's go right side first. So right side is the read latencies. So this is, um, you know, uh, median, median uh, latency. Um, it's a little bit of too much detail, but I mean, what you can generally see is that, you know, as you throttle more, um, you know, latency goes lower, right? That's what you want to see. So you can, you can control your latency response by how much you throttle. And obviously, you know, beyond a certain point, you know, you, you know, there's no, no difference, right? The, the device is just doing what the device can do. But as you go, go throttle down more and more, you can improve the latency response. And, and you can you know, pick a line here, pick a point here, um, for example, if you have a specific a latency requirement. Uh, <clears throat> but Benjamin, the, can I ask a question? <laughs> Two questions. One is on the previous slide, you talked about isolation. Uh, mm -hmm. Why is isolation in the scope? And yeah. what is throttling in this scope? Okay, so, um, okay, isolation, there's an isograph. Okay, isolation. Um, isolation factor is defined as, um, um, so let's say your target RPS is 100, right? Um, and then you start memory hog, memory hog, right? Memory interference or, or whatever interference, right? And you wait until that, that experiment is over or times out, right? And then you, you measure um, the latency, the RPS you actually observed during that time period, and you divide that by your target RPS. So 100% isolation mean, means that you, know, you were able to keep uh, your RPS at the target level, you know, although something was going on in the system. 50% means that you, know, you lost half of your work because there was something else going on in the system. Um, and, in reverse, latency impact, well, not in reverse, but in conjunction, latency impact is defined as your target latency, uh, you know, that's the divider, and you know, the observed latency is the, if it, oh, I'm getting confused. Anyways, you know, it's the <laughs> observed latency over target latency, right? Um, so if you look at this graph, right, this is showing um, latency impact. Oh, it's just not, not a great fit because the device is not, not the most consistent one. But you can see that as you, you throttle down the device more and more, you can control latency impact. Uh, you can lower your, your you know, latency impact gradually. And uh, this is the isolation factor, ISO one. The reason why you know, it, it doesn't uh, drip down, uh, you know, drop like that, it should, is because you know, uh, the benchmark is tuning the size to, to meet this target. But anyways, this is the, showing the ISO one. Um, yes. Anyways, um, I, I think there's a little bit too much detail um, to go into in this session, but what it does is that um, um, let me, uh, so for example, I, I'm just gonna give you one example, uh, give one, one example. Um, this is uh, called MOF graph. It's a memory offloading factor graph. What it, uh, in memory offloading factor is defined as um, supportable memory footprint over physical memory, right? Available memory. So. If you have a memory uh, offloading factor of two, it means that your system can support twice as large memory footprint than your physical memory, um, while not missing your latency targets because your all those pages can go to I/O device and I/O device is fast enough to 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 service all those requests without missing latency target, right? So that's how uh, MOF is defined, and the uh, the MOF um, is so, so it's a, a latency bound bandwidth measure, right? So higher band, uh, MOF means that, um, um, you know, your IO device is doing more IOs, but also while uh, within certain latency limits, because if, you're, if your device is, uh, is high latency while doing those IOs, RPS wouldn't be able to hold at the target level, right? So it's a latency bound bandwidth measure. Um, so on this device, on this particular device, because of conjunction of all these latency graphs changing, right? Uh, this is the eventual graph we get. Uh, while not missing latency target, um, the, the memory 
footprint that we can serve is about 1.45. And then as we throttle the device, throttle, uh, you ask about throttling too. Throttling is just that um, the IO controller has a general understanding of how much the device can do through model parameters. And as you tell them, tell it to throttle it more and more, the device just kind of, uh, the controller slows down how quickly IOs can be issued to the device. So at 50% uh, throttling level, um, you know, it's issuing, it's, it's gating uh, requests, it's holding requests so that it doesn't go faster than, you know, 50% of what the device can do at maximum throughput. Um, so as you throttle more and more, the uh, MOF drops, right? Because you, you get less and less bandwidth. Um, so you, eventually you, you fit the graphs and you get this line and um, you can pick here, right? If you pick here, um, this is the point where you get maximum bandwidth, right? Maximum MOF um, while staying lowest in the throttling level. Or on the other hand, while obtaining the lowest latency, you are still getting the, you know, you're not losing on bandwidth side, but you're obtaining you know, the best latency you can obtain, right? Um, so that's an example of how, how solutions are calculated. So, um, so this is um, how solutions look. Um, it's, it calculates like, a, like, I don't know, six solutions, but um, this is you know, how, um, how two of those solutions look. And uh, this is a binary solution. And you know, it considers those factors and, and spits out these numbers. And this is what you know, these parameters, RBPS, RCQOps, and QS parameters, these are what can be entered into uh, the kernel configuration to configure your IO device so that you know, it can be controlled. Um, so this is one example of how a usage control bench uh, is used. Dejan, and, we um, are coming up on, uh, it's about five minutes left. Um, just wanted to make sure. Sure, you have, yeah. yeah, I am uh, all done with the slides. So we're okay. okay, okay. So Thank if you. you wanna try out research control demo, you can visit uh, this website. Uh, there's a you know, GitHub, and, and we are in the process of um, preparing another kind of big release. We, so what is released right now, uh, version 1.0 doesn't have resource control bench in it. Um, so we're gonna be releasing uh, another one pretty soon, hopefully in a month, um, which has resource control bench in it. But if you go to the site, you can still try the entirety of resource control demo and, and you know, read everything in it. Um, which can be interesting. I, I, you know, I enjoy building it. So, um, so keep the shot, and the slides will be, you know, shared too. And that's it. Um, that's the. Uh, I'm gonna put the address. If anybody has any questions, yeah, we have five minutes, as Shah just said. Can the resource control framework be used along with Kubernetes containerized workloads? I don't know. Um, I don't think um, so. There, there we uh, there were some discussions around that, but but um, right now, um, resource control, resource control, uh, the entire thing um, to to implement like comprehensive resource control, the requirements are fairly high. Right? I mean, you gotta be on Secret two. You gotta use uh, IO cost controller. Uh, you gotta be on ButtFS for now at least. Um, so. So that, that doesn't you know, quite jive with um, what Kubernetes is doing right now. Um, so, so I don't think it works right now, but you know, there, there, there were talks about it. And um, hopefully down the line, we will be able to. But right now the, the system requirements are just kind of you know, a little bit difficult to meet uh, for Kubernetes environment, if I understand correctly, that's my understanding. So the question from uh, uh, Macon, I, I don't know whether I'm reading the name right, but um, I, I gotta sit down and actually think about it. You know? um, so I'm, I'm gonna answer that even, like later, but I, I'm not gonna try to do that right now. I just you know, have a hard time parsing it right now. Thank you. So Tejan, uh, one question. Um, yeah. Have you uh, played with the memory optimizer that Oracle um, uh, user user space mm -hmm. application that predicts um, memory usage scenarios and then proactively reclaims them. Do, if you were to use that in conjunction with your resource control, 
Mm. Do you see you you could have more benefits? Is that is that the memory optimization thing? Um, I, I haven't used it, but uh, is that trying to detect hard and cold memory and offload cold memory? Um, well, yes. I mean, it it uh, it predicts the free um, predict predict. It uses a little bit of a predictiveness mm. of where essentially you have watermarks, right? The memory uh, watermarks, mm -hmm. and then it'll it it'll kind of adjust the watermarks so that uh, optimizer kicks in quicker. So, so that you are not experiencing the uh, workloads don't experience pressure. So I can give you a link to that. Yeah, sure. um, yeah, and then, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I'm curious. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens if you were to um, use that in conjunction with uh, okay. uh, yeah. your, um, your so resource control? It's in, in resource control demo, it's in, explained in resource control demo too, but we use something called standby um, mm -hmm. um, to, for sizing. Um, so what it tries to do is that it tries to um, measure the actual working set size rather than you know dropping all the cold memory. Um, so we, we try to measure the actual memory consumption of needed working set size. Right. Um, so that's what we primarily use for sizing uh, inside Facebook, um, and and that's open source too, and it's you know fully explained in 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 this open control demo. Right. Um, yeah, but that's what what we we primarily looked at. We haven't looked at uh, memory optimizer for, for Okay. Marco. So the difference I see is that. Uh, your your solution is very controlled solution in the sense that you have to understand your workloads. You have to set aside resources to some extent. You have to you have to have a characteristics of mm. your workload. Um, so I wondered if a generic solution like MemOptimizer, I mean, it's only memory. I know you were going with other resources, but just curious thought. Just I was thinking. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I put it in the chat. You don't have to yeah, yeah. Also, cancel yeah, I, that I can't now, but just something. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, just on the contribution side, um, because we, we use, even on the memory side, we use memory the low instead of memory the high or max. Um, configuration is fairly easy. Um, so we basically use a single configuration for most of our machines. Like um, because, you know, uh, as wrong, and, and it's tied to um, machine, all, like resource allocation, right? So when a task, because you know, X amount of memory, then we can base allocation on that. So it's not quite that difficult to get that configuration right for us in this. Yeah, but yeah. But I mean, sizing definitely is a difficult problem that everybody's you know, trying to tackle. Thank you. All right, well, I just wanna thank you to Tejun and Shua for their time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you're able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Bye guys.